So recording is walking, so welcome back everyone. We're talking about application programming interfaces because we want to query the database, not just single query by single query, but we want to talk to a database generally when we use uh, a programming language. So an API in computer programming is an application programming interface, which is a set of subroutines um, that allows you to query a database um, or update a database from within a programming language, yeah, which means that within R you connect to the database and then hey, you just query the database from R in, in for example, a for loop, yeah, which allows you to query hundreds of genes um, in a row without having to go through the web interface and, and clicking um, on it every time. <clears throat> so we will get back to application programming interfaces when we talk about Biomart um, to connect uh, to the main biological databases such as um, um, uh, Ensemble and these kinds of databases. So like I told you a lot of data is available so what does a bioinformatician do with all of this data? Well the main thing for which you can use databases is to develop new hypotheses um, and had like have an idea of um, well this is my gene of interest but which other genes should I be looking at as well. Um, a database of course provides you a way to do reproducible research yeah, because you can query a database and then you can save those results and you can store them. Um, it also helps to put results that you have obtained into a historical context. For example, if you think back to the OMIM database, which has data spanning back 80 to 90 years, and so you can see if your experimental results ha are in line with experiments that people did in the 1970s or the 1980s, and then see if your results make sense or if your results are showing something different. Um, and you can validate results that have been obtained by others by again checking data to see if the results that they came up with are consistent with what people found before. So um, very, very interesting um, topic hey, and there's like literally like gigabytes and gigabytes of data out there which you can use. Um, but for all of this we need tools to kind of do reproducible research but also to compare results to see if the significance that we got or the direction of the effect is the same as what other people have found. Um, so uh, of course the statistical analysis will just go through a couple of little things. Um, I will show you a couple of um, examples from uh, real research that we did in the past couple of years um, and of, there will be a whole lecture about statistics and about how we can do statistics either using R um, and what these things mean. Um, but today I just want to have a little bit of an overview of descriptive statistics like uh, when we talk about mean or variance or correlation um, and I want to show you a different some different types of visual analysis which I think is really useful because only when you visualize your results do you get an idea of what's really going on. And so we will talk about scatter plots, box plots, histograms and heat maps um, which are kind of the four main visualization techniques when we're talking about data. So when we talk about descriptive statistics there's two flavors. One of them is the uh, univariate analysis which means that you are looking at a single variable um, or a single kind of measurement. Um, so have we, are, we for example measured body weight and um, had then we want to show to other people how the body weight of our animals was distributed. Uh, what was the mean, what was the variation, what is the standard deviation. Um, and then you have bivariate analysis and bivariate analysis is something like correlation where you take two phenotypes and you look to see if there is a relationship between them and if there is a relationship what kind of a relationship there is. So when we talk about the mean um, we generally talk about the arithmetic mean. Um, when we will talk about the mean later on. I will also show you different types of mean uh, means because the arithmetic mean is the most common one but sometimes not the best one to use. Um, and of course when you talk about the mean um, it is just summing up all the numbers and dividing by n which is the number of numbers. I, I think that everyone knows how to calculate a arithmetic mean. 
Um, the median is very related to the mean. It is the numerical value separating the higher half of the data from the lower half. Uh, the median of a finite list of numbers can be found by arranging all the observations from lowest value to highest values and picking the middle one. Of course, when you have an even number of observations, then you take the two middle ones and then you take the arithmetic mean of those. So mean tells you something about what the average is. The median tells you more or less what the, well, what the middle of the data is, which doesn't have to be the same thing. When you talk about variance, and then variance is a measurement of how far apart or how spread out your numbers are. Um, and of course, when you have a variance of zero, that means that all your measurements that you did are identical. Um, the nice thing about variance is that it's always non-negative and the bigger the variance, the higher the distribution of the data. So the more difference there is between the, the lowest and the highest animal um, and it gives you an idea of how the, the, the distribution of your data more or less looks. Um, so the variance is, uh, the mean is generally in the middle when you talk about a normal distribution and the variance tells you kind of how, how, how wide the curve is. When we talk about correlation, then correlation is a measurement uh, between two variables and correlations are very useful um, because they can indicate a predictive relationship that can be exploited in practice. Um, and that's one of the reasons why correlations are used so much. Hey, you often hear people say that correlation does not equate to causation. That is of course true, but the opposite is generally not true. So when you have causation between two things, they are often, very often correlated. Um, yeah, so that means that hey, even though two things might need not have a causative relationship, if there is a correlation, then you can still exploit that. Uh, think about, for example, um, stocks or the stock market. If you know that when the, when the temperature outside goes up, the stocks of uh, ice cream manufacturer rise as well. This is because during hot weather, people tend to buy more ice cream. And so there, here there is a correlation, which is not directly a causative relation. The temperature outside does not make stock prices go up. It's indirect, but still, when you know that, you can earn a lot of money because hey, when the temperature is going up or you see the weather report saying that, well, the temperature will like rise in the coming days, and then, of course, it's a good time to buy stocks of ice cream manufacturers because there's a big probability that they will rise as well. All right, so a little bit of an example of some iridium in horses that we did, and I, I just I just wanted to go kind of through the different phenotype measurements that we did and how we can kind of relate these to each other. Um, so here we are looking at Arabian horses. Arabian horses come in five different breeds or six different breeds, depending on how you kind of define them. Um, and um, the main breeds are Kalabi, Saklabi and Hamdani. So they are phys physical measurements that we did on different different types of Arabian horses. And the first thing that you have to do when you look at phenotypic data is look for outliers. Um, there's things like comma errors, where someone put the comma wrong, hey, which means that all of a sudden one of the individuals either 10 times higher or 10 times lower, um, just because the comma is at a wrong position. So if someone wanted to write down 37.6, um, but they wrote down 3.76. And of course, hey, if you see that, then you can easily like change the number um, as or leave it out. With a scatter plot, yes, yes. So if I look at my uh, my data, I generally do something like this. So I take two phenotypes, um, like the the width of the phenotype chest, um, or the the width of the horse's chest, and then I plot that against the body length, um, and then you get a scatter plot. And of course, here you see that some individuals are relatively small right the body length is relatively small but the chest width is also relatively small so here i do not really suspect that someone messed up a comma uh, error and so here you see the different types of horses so the, the color of the dot means that we're either looking at a kalabi a saklabi or an hamdani and here you can see that in this plot it seems to be that the kalawi have a slightly higher or a bigger chest uh, compared to, for example, the Hamdami horses, eh, because eh, they're 
body length is more or less in the same range, right? So it, it ranges from around like 1 meter 30 to around 1 meter 70 for the red dots and the black dots. But you see that the red dots on average have a higher or a bigger chest, um, even though they are of the same length. So hey, when they are like 1 meter 60, then the black dots are more or less around here, while the red dots are a little bit further apart. And of course you can do the same thing for different phenotypes like the girth of the neck and to see if there are relationships and of course when you have an outlier uh, the outlier will be f very far away especially in this case when you're talking about something measured in centimeters and when someone makes a comma error and then either the horse now has a, a body length of 12 centimeters and which of course for a horse is, is way too small. Yeah, but the first thing that you do is make some scatter plots, um, plot the different phenotypes against each other. Um, so on the left, a positive correlation. Yeah, yeah, you can you can more or less see a positive correlation here. Um, so hey, the, the bigger your body, the bigger your chest, um, but it doesn't really seem like the neck girth has anything to do with the body length, right? That seems to be more like a single ball. And there's like four individuals here which have a very low girth of the neck um, and a very low body weight, but they seem to be kind of outlier, so strange in this distribution. Um, because most of the horses are here and these four are kind of outside. So here you see indeed a positive correlation, which makes sense, right? The, the bigger your body, the bigger your chest. Um, and it doesn't really seem to be the case when you look at the neck. So hey, when you look at the body length, it seems to be not highly correlated with the neck girth. Probably the correlation here is slightly positive, um, driven by a couple of outliers. But hey, just visualizing your data will give you an initial impression of, of if people made errors when collecting the data. You can do a visual analysis in a different way. So here we're looking at box plots. Um, so box plots come in two flavors. On the left side you see the more or less standard box plots. Here you see the body length, right? So you can see that um, it, you don't see much difference in the median of the body length, but you can see uh, that the Kalawis, um, so the red ones, seem to have less variance. So they seem to be more uniform, while the other two breeds have a much bigger range of, of body, uh, body length. Um, on the other side we see a box plot which is notched, and notched, notched box plots tell you something about if two phenotypes are significantly different. And so what you see here is, is that you see the notch ranging from here to here, for the for the, the the gray box, so for the hamdamis, and then you see here the notch for the kalawis, and you see that these two notches they overlap. So if they overlap, it means that there's no significant difference between the body length of the kalawi versus the body length of the hamdami. And so it's a little bit of statistics, it's more uh, kind of by eye statistics, but if, if one of these boxes would be much much lower and the notches would not overlap, then there would be a really good indication that there is um, a, something different between the different, um, different, different horse types in this case that we're looking at. And so the spacing between the different parts of the box indicates the degree of dispersion, the spread of the data, and so it's kind of a measurement of the variance and a little bit of the skewness because you can see here that the part, yeah, the notches show the 95% confidence interval surrounding the median. Um, so you see that, um, and so a box plot is in this way, the, this is the median, then the box itself contains 50% um, of the data and then here in these waxes is 95% of the data. So 95% of the measurements, or in this case 100% of the measurements, fall between 1 meter 20 for the Saklawi uh, up until 1 meter 70, while for example in the Hamdamis they're they're bigger on average. So they are like 1 meter 35 up until 1 meter 70. So the notches, um, they show the 95% confidence interval, but in many cases you can you can change the 95%. So you could say give me 70% notches or give me 99% notches. Um, but the default is generally 95% confidence interval. Yeah, but 
it's just a way of representing your data and when I look at box plots I generally tend to look at them notched um, because then if there is a significant difference you can directly see that because the notches do not overlap um, with each other and in this case all of the notches they overlap right because the, the notch here is is captured within the notch of the green box so these two distributions are not different from each other or at least the median is not different from each other but had just a visual inspection of your data before you start doing any analysis. Um, another thing that I always look at is make histograms. So for example, when I look at the body length, and now I haven't separated it out by the three different reads, yeah, but you can see that yeah, the, the body length looks more or less like a bimodal distribution. There seem to be horses which are more or less here. So there seems to be a little normal distribution here with a mean around or median around 140. And then there seems to be a second kind of normal distribution on the top with horses which on average are like 160 uh, centimeters big. Um, for chest girth you see that the distribution looks different um, but again hey, it's not a perfect normal distribution but it kind of looks like a normal. Um, hey, of course when when it is very strange, when hey, there's no data and then you see one big peak and then nothing hey, and then of course you really have to wonder like what what's going on and why are there some animals which are this small um, while other animals are, are like relatively big. Uh, but normally when you measure phenotypes, especially classical phenotypes on animals or plants, you expect most phenotypes to follow either a normal distribution, so a, a Gaussian distribution, or a bimodal Gaussian distribution. Uh, did you take the median because of the outliers? Um, in this case there are no real outliers. Um, the median in, is, generally I prefer the median above the mean in almost all cases. Uh, the median, since it's half of the data is lower than the median, half of the data is higher than the median, it gives you a more truer estimate of what, what like half of the data looks like. Um, so I generally prefer median uh, cross mean uh, because the mean is heavily influenced by like high numbers like outliers, right? The, the, the average salary in Germany is much higher than the median salary and that's because some people earn like 20 million a year um, but that's, those are only a few people but these few people they drag the distribution up that much that when you look at the mean uh, the median is much better so the median income per country is a much better measurement than the average income so the, the mean income um, so I generally prefer the median um, above mean um, but it, it depends on everyone. Um, histograms um, actually have been uh, are an invention by Carl Pearson Carl Pearson is very well known for Pearson correlation. Um, so um, it's a funny story because Pearson correlation is actually not invented by Carl Pearson. Carl Pearson is the inventor of the histogram. So uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of times in science that someone gets credited for an invention which is actually not his invention. So Pearson correlation is not invented by Carl Pearson, the histogram is invented by Carl Pearson, but for some reason the invention of Pearson correlation actually got ascribed to, to Pearson, um, if that makes sense. There's actually, a f it's actually Stigler's law um, that all main inventions in science are actually accredited to other people. So that if you invent something there's a big chance that someone else's name will be on there in the end instead of your name. Um, anyway, histograms invented by Carl Pearson. Very good to just have a quick overview of how the distribution of your data uh, looks. Um, Alright, and then heat maps. Heat maps, I like looking at heat maps. Um, it's it's more difficult to look at it. I've noticed that especially people who are not from kind of a computational field, so people who are really like, um, it sounds like derogatory, but I call them butterfly biologists, so biologists that go out into a field and catch butterflies, so that are really like um, doing biology instead of um, being in a lab or doing data analysis. Um, but I don't mean it in a bad way, because you need butterfly biologists as well, but they tend to um, not really understand heat maps. 
um, they find it difficult to reason about. But the nice thing about a heat map is, is that you can kind of visualize three dimensions, right? Because you have like one dimension, so the, the horse dimension on the, uh, on the y-axis here, then on the x-axis you have all of the different phenotypes that we measured, and then the color is kind of the, um, the height or the difference in this case between uh, the the phenotype and uh, and 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 the horse. And so what you see here is is that we look when we look at the chest measurements that hey, all of the measurements for all of these horses don't seem to be that different, um, but there seems to be a massive difference, and the Kalawi seems to have a much wider chest compared to the other horse breeds in this case. Um, so they are hey, they have a in this case it's a it's a lot score, which is a p-value kind of uh, way that I visualized. Um, but the Kalawi seem to have a much, much bigger or deeper chest um, than the other horses, which makes sense because Kalawi are the racing type of Arabian horses, while the Hamdamis are more the show horses and the Saklawi are kind of the work type Arabian horses. So it makes sense that the Kalawi has a has a different chest because hey, when you're a race horse, you need a lot of air to be able to perform well, um, while if you're more or less a workhorse, it doesn't really matter that much um, because it's more like the endurance and not so much the kind of peak performance. Um, so a very good way of visualizing data, especially when you have multiple dimensions. Um, so hey, when you look at multiple phenotypes across multiple species or multiple um, subspecies, um, it's a very good way of visualizing data and showing um, where the differences are. All right, so of course there's some more advanced statistics that we will go into later again, um, and I just wanted to tell you that like one of the main things as a bioinformatician is this, that you have to do hypothesis testing, right? So you have a certain hypothesis and you want to know if a result is statistically significantly different. Um, and hey, in Normally when we use the term significant, then we mean something which is unlikely to have occurred by chance alone. And of course there's many, many different methods to define or to calculate uh, significance. And so the, the most basic significance test that you have is a t-test um, where you just have two groups and you want to know if the mean of the one group is different from the mean of the other group. Um, we have much more advanced statistical testing if you want to correct for all kinds of other factors like the, the sex of an animal or the age of uh, the body weight. So then you can do things like ANOVAS, which is very similar to a t-test. You still want to know if there's a difference between two groups or three groups um, when you correct for different environmental factors like the sex or um, the farm at which they grew up. And then of course nowadays it's very hip to use machine learning um, so that you have a test and a training set um, so to do kind of assignment um, which is not really going into like is something significantly different it's more about which features are different between um, different observations. Um, but there will be a whole lecture about statistics. I just wanted to have it mentioned that hypothesis testing is one of these things that as a bioinformatician is one of your main things that, that, that you do. Um, so when you talk about testing, of course you always have to mention multiple testing because in this case, um, if we look at our data, we have three different horse strains. Um, so when we want to test if there are any significant differences between these three horse strains, um, then normally we agree that when a p-value is lower than 0 0.05, uh, it is significant. And why is that? Because if it is less likely than 1 in 20, then we say, well, then it's unlikely to have occurred by chance. And so that's where the one in f um, where the 0 0.05 threshold comes from. And of course, this is a very weird threshold because, in theory, if you would think about gravity, if you would take an object and you would release the object, and 19 out of 20 times it would fall to the ground, and one of the times it would fly up in space, then we would still say gravity exists because like one out of 20 is not enough to discredit gravity. 
Um, so, and of course, that's why in other fields, um, like in physics, they work with a p-value, which is one times minus five, and that means a zero point zero 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 one. Um, so head there, they require much more evidence before they say something is significantly different. But in biology, we generally take the 0 .00, 0 0.5 threshold. And that is because, well, 1 in 20 is kind of our bread and butter. So if, it, if 19 out of 20 times we find an effect, then we believe that this effect is real. Um, of course, we always have to deal with multiple testing. And... In this case, because we have three horse species, we can test the Hamdami versus the Saklavi, we can test the Hamdami versus the Kalabi, and we can test the Kalabi versus the Saklavi, right? So we always do three tests. So for every phenotype, like body length, uh, we, we test all of these three possibilities, um, but we need to preserve our one in, one in 20 threshold. Right, because we don't want to have, because if we do three tests, eh, that would mean that instead of allowing 19 out of 20 to be similar, we now demand more to be similar. So we now demand 1 in 60. So that would mean that our p-value goes from 0 0.05 uh, to a, a p-value of 0 0.016. And then if the p-value is below this, then we say that something is significantly different. So you always have to correct for the number of tests that you do. And this, this falls into the fact that if you do a statistical test and you do a hundred statistical tests, then five of them will be significantly different because of the fact that we have an alpha level of, of 5%. Because we, uh, we, we don't care in 5% of the cases if the cases are different from um, the general. So and we will go back in and talk about multiple testing a lot. I have like one more slide and in bioinformatics, we're often dealing with thousands and thousands of statistical tests. Generally, we want to know if a gene is different in the one species versus the other species. And of course, there are 20,000 genes in the genome. So the, the chances of making a mistake and saying that something is significantly changed while it is not is really high. Uh, when you do 20,000 tests. So this is called a type 1 error. So the type 1 error is um, calling something significantly changed while it's not, or it's due to chance, and you can avoid the type 1 errors by doing Bonferroni correction. Then there's the type 2 error, and type 2 error is saying that something is not significantly different while it actually is, so you are missing a significant change, and you can avoid this by a Benjamin Hochberg false discovery rate procedure. Um, but these will come back. Um, I always find this a little bit difficult, so I always call the type 1 error the false positive, so something which is which you, you say is positive, but it's actually not. Um, and the type 2 error is a false negative, so that means that something that you say is not changed is actually different between the groups that you are dealing with. So, um, But we will get back to multiple testing and how to properly deal with multiple testing. There are multiple strategies, and this is just the most um, simple one. And the uh, Bonferroni correction is just taking your p-value, divided by the number of tests, and that is your new p-value threshold. Uh, Benjamin Hochberg is a little bit more difficult, but uh, they're the most simple ways of dealing with it. Is it an alpha or beta error? So these are alpha errors, so errors on the alpha scale. So you have the, the, the beta errors come in um, when you are dealing with uh, the true positive, true negative rates. But here we're just talking about the alpha. So calling something significant while it is not, or calling something not significant while it is. Um, so it's the, the alpha error rate. But we will have a whole discussion. I think there's a whole lecture about, like, well, not a whole lecture, but there's a lecture about statistics and um, more about statistics. I just wanted to mention it in this context, since hey, when we're looking at three horse breeds, um, there's a chance of saying that something is significantly different between the horse breed, um, just because you have three tests for every phenotype. All right, so a couple of words about plots and statistics. For example, when you are using R, so programming languages such as R can create these plots and do of the statistical analysis for you. However, make sure that you know what you are doing. Huh? That just because you are programming it and just because you are feeding it information does not guarantee that the results that you are getting are correct. 
um, always know what you're trying to do and or consult a statistician. So I'm a pretty good statistician, but I do have people that I call when I need help. So always make sure that you know someone or have someone as a backup that can help you and advise you on what is the best statistical test to do. Hey, is it better to do a t-test or should I go to a non-parametric t-test because my distribution is not really normal. Um, and if you want to really learn how to, to program and do statistics, then of course I am teaching an R course in the summer semester and you're more than welcome to, to join the, the, the course. It's a very introductory course, so we start off very basic, um, but from like lecture three to four on, we kind of ramp up the difficulty quite tremendously. Um, and in the end, the idea is, is that people can make their own plots, look at their own data and do some statistical analysis on their data to see if there's any differences between the measurements that they got. Um, so if you're really interested in statistics and in making making plots or in learning how to, to program, um, then um, I, the, it's a little bit of a plug to follow the R introduction course. Um, and of course just subscribing or following me on the channel will mean that you get an email when I'm starting the summer course. So. All right, so and what does statistics tell us? So and descriptive statistics is very useful to detect outliers, to have an exploratory data analysis to see if anything is wrong, um, and it can help us to decide which model or distribution is suitable to use on our data. And if you are and doing hypothesis testing, then of course it, it tests, it gives you a, a probability that your hypothesis is true given the data uh, that you give to the to the algorithm. So and these are really the things that statistics can tell us. Um, and statistics is just a tool, uh, one of many tools in, in the toolbox um, that, that you need to, uh, to analyze data. All right, so I always like to end more or less with uh, project planning, um, because if you're talking about statistics, then of course you always have to cite uh, Ronald Fisher. And Ronald Fisher has this really nice quote where he say to consult the to consult the statistician after an experiment is finished is often merely to ask him to conduct a post-mortem examination. He can perhaps say what the experiment died of. And this is really true in science. I see a lot of people getting a lot of money for projects and then doing the project and then realizing that they actually had 50 samples too little. So if they would have done 50 more samples, then they could have really proven what they wanted to prove. Um, but now their p-value is just not good enough because they didn't have the sample size. Um, so if you're planning on doing um, a big project proposal and you want to ask for a million euros from the European Union to have a certain research project, then do make sure that you ask a statistician before you start your experiment um, because that can really really open your eyes to kind of realize what you want to do and how many samples you would need um, or if you need to increase the dosage of your treatment versus control group and these kinds of things. Um, so in that notion I actually made a statement myself because I think why should you consult a bioinformatician nowadays I think besides a statistician you should always consult a bioinformatician especially when you are doing things like DNA or RNA sequencing experiments because uh, you're talking about data storage like 60 to a terabyte of data per sample um, you're talking about massive amounts of computer analysis time, like two, 20 to 200 hours of computation just per sample. Um, and a bioinformatician can also help you with things like sample size estimates. Um, if you're dealing with German tear shoots or animal welfare, hey, what are the minimum number of samples that I need to get a significant results? Um, and a bioinformatician can also help you to get informed about what statistics you might be able to use or um, how to properly randomize samples. Um, for example, when you're doing a microarray experiment. Um, and of course, these things are, are kind of logical, um, but I see them being overlooked in a lot of the experiments uh, that, that I see uh, being done nowadays, especially the DNA and RNA sequencing experiments. Like I've run into biologists that say, well, I have like 
500 of my Arabidopsis plants and they're growing in a greenhouse and we're going to sequence them all and I have the money to sequence them all and then you ask but how much money do you have to buy a massive server to store all the data and do you have a cluster somewhere to analyze all of the data and then they never thought about it so they, they write their project proposal they ask for money for the experiments for the plants for the sequencing but then they forget that the data has to live somewhere as well and that they have to analyze the data as well and all of these things cost money as well like computer time is not free if you want a hundred hours or 200 hours of computer time um, then of course um, if you buy that at Amazon that will cost you a certain amount of money as well so when you plan a project consult a statistician for the basic statistics um, but also consult a bioinformatician um, especially when it comes to things like data storage and analysis time uh, which you have to calculate into your project proposal and into um, how much money you need to apply for and of course this is still far away for many of you guys although um, uh, when you're in your master phase then when you start doing your PhD or when you're thinking about doing a PhD then these things become um, more and more like a day-to-day -day issue um, all right um, so that's it four five nine so we're one minute before um, so what I told you today is I told you about phenotypes about traits about what is a qualitative trait what's this quantitative trait um, I told you about Mendelian traits quantitative statistics um, we talked a very little little bit about statistical analysis um, we looked at a couple of phenotypic databases which are out there which I which I think are useful um, I we had a little like two words about multiple testing um, and a little bit about project planning um, but I think that's all of it for today um, there's nothing really more that I wanted to say unless there are any questions um, so the homework for today is on Moodle um, it is five questions with ABCD and most of these questions are going to the IMPC and the OMIM database and um, just finding some things in the database and then seeing what is known about it all right good so let me quickly check how many people we are left with we are left with one two three four five six seven eight nine ten good so ten people left at the end of the lecture so that's pretty good so if there's any question then um, when should we submit the homework you should not submit the homework you should just do the homework and write down the answers for yourself and then at the beginning um, of the uh, at the beginning of the next lecture I will go through the questions and I will show you where you can find the answers um, so I'm not going to check homework that's something that people do in high school um, I'm just here to show you what's possible and it's up to you to be interested in and do the questions and of course if you have any issues with the questions or the homework uh, then just send me an email and yes Sandra I will I will send you a, a, a PDF um, I'm still setting up something on my website so that I can mirror the Moodle there for people that don't have access to the Moodle um, although I think I might actually be able to invite you on Moodle as a uh, as a guest lecture or a guest uh, guest account so I will look into that if I can't get the Moodle to work for you then I will just send you an email and Oleksandr I hope I'm pronouncing your name right uh, thanks yeah thank you guys for watching like um, it's only fun when there's people asking questions um, so that I can sit there for three hours and talk to myself as well but it's it's more fun when uh, <laughs> when people are here so all right commando see you next week how do you get the little crown in front of your name commando is that, a, is that something that you can, can share with us? <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, I will stop the recording. And